become interested in gerontology? Well, my, my, a lot of things in life, I just kind of fell into it. I was in the graduate program at sociology at Syracuse, and it was very theoretical, very research oriented, and I just wanted to do survey research and uh, public opinion research. And then I realized that I had a couple friends who were having a lot more fun than I was. And it turned out they were research assistants down at the Gerontology Center at Syracuse. So I just wandered down there one day, um, asked to meet with whoever was in charge, I think, and it turned out to be Walter Beatty, and asked if there was something I could do. And they put me to work computerizing their mailing list, um, complete with creating punch cards and running them through the mainframe. And I just stayed down there. It was a, a lot of people, both students and faculty at the Gerontology Center, who were really committed to what they were doing and learning. And they really had a clear vision for how they wanted to, to interact with or, be, or work on behalf of older adults. And that really appealed to me because I really didn't have a clear vision for myself at that point. I still don't some days. So I just stayed there, got a research assistantship, started focusing on older adult education, um, which I carried on through my doctoral program and really developed a, a career commitment just by looking around to see who was having more fun than I was. I like that. That's a great <laughs> way to do it. I mean, that is just, that is so awesome. Well, when, you're, when you start grad school, you're so much at the mercy of other people who tell you what you should be taking and learning and doing. And, and this was a way for me to find my own way. So that was helpful. I think that that's awesome. That is so great. <laughs> so you can kind of then maybe describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. And was there a point in your career that you started using gerontologists to describe yourself? At the time I was working on my doctoral degree, which was the late 70s and early 80s, no one was calling themselves a gerontologist. Um, my boss at the time at the Institute on Aging at Wisconsin, who was, was Martin Loeb, and he wrote an article, a chapter for a book, and what, the title of which was, there's no such profession as, profession as a gerontologist, either the, no, I'm, let me try that again. Gerontology is not a profession, either the oldest or the youngest. That's what it was. Um, and so people were not considering themselves that. It was important that you be rooted in a disciplinary base, and you could study old people if you wanted to, but you had to be something else first. I continued, after grad school, sort of continued falling into jobs because the one I really wanted for myself no longer existed. Um, I, I wanted to be a gerontology center director, but when Ronald Reagan cut most of the funding for gerontology centers in 1981, a lot of them either went out of business or stopped hiring, um, stopped thriving in many ways for many years. So I had just um, started looking at other options related to adult education, particularly training. I ended up unemployed for a couple of years. And in 1986, started working at AARP. And it was really probably only when I got to AARP that I started calling myself a gerontologist. At AARP, in spite of the mission that they have solely to work on behalf of older adults, there really at the time were maybe f 10 to 15 people in the whole organization who had any formal training in gerontology. Wow. As much as a class even. Wow. Um, but as I said, it was that core of 10 or 15 people who had degrees or certificates or some core level of training. And so it became not important, but helpful to identify yourself as someone who had that expertise. So that's probably what I started saying I was a gerontologist, although for years I kept telling the IRS I was a researcher because I figured they wouldn't know what a gerontologist was. Of course not. <laughs> People still don't. Probably not. <laughs> So, did you have female mentors who impacted your move uh, into, and you, you mentioned about you know, going into AARP and your move into to the field, um, and who was that, if you had any, and um, how, how did that maybe occur? I 
think I was already in the field before I ran across my first female mentor. I started working for Walter Beatty at Syracuse, and then I worked for Martin Loeb at Wisconsin, both of whom are past presidents of Aggie, as you know, and both of whom were long careered in gerontology at that point already. When I got to Wisconsin and started doing my graduate work there, um, my doctoral work, I met Vivian Wood, who was also a professor of social welfare, plus she had an appointment in the Institute on Aging at Wisconsin. And Vivian, without ever doing anything overt, mentors everybody. Wow. Probably still does. Um, she just naturally gravitates to, to students, to younger faculty, and shows them the way in very subtle ways. Um, she never said, I'm, now I'm going to mentor you. Um, I never asked her to mentor me. <laughs> but she really served as a role model for me of, of what I wanted to become and how I wanted to interact and, and how to mediate um, situations well. Martin Loeb was very much uh, into university politics. And so he was always willing to dive in and fight with the appropriate deans and provosts and all that thing to, to get what we wanted. But Vivian is the one who really brought together the faculty in working together on aging issues and brought together the community to support what the university was doing related to aging. So it was from her that I really learned how to operate well in an academic environment, which I thought at the time was going to be my future career. It turned out, of course, it wasn't. But. <laughs> But you learned a lot. I from, learned a lot. From that. <clears throat> I did. And then in 19, oh gosh, 77 maybe, or 78, I met Millie Seltzer. Wow. And Millie was the same way. Um, she really did look out for students. And I was both working at the Institute on Aging as, as an assistant director at the time, plus going to to grad school to finish my PhD. So Millie was one, another one who showed me how, not a, it's not a subtle approach, it's more like an indirect approach, how you can really manage people and manage situations and create consensus without pounding people over the head as you did it. There were people on the, I was serving on the Augie board at the time even as director of Communications Committee, I think. And there were people on that board who, who did have the big hammer and used it quite often. And Millie would just sort of look around and say, well, you know, we could do it this way. And that's how it ended up being done. And Millie always seemed to have the right answer, <laughs> that she just very casually and very calmly would interject into a situation. So I learned a lot from her as well. That, that seems, having watched your, kind of some of your leadership style, it, seems to me that you really picked a lot of that up from Millie. That's, that's cool. I learned how to, how to listen well from people like Millie and Vivian. Um, if you listen well and then you figure out where people are coming from and then you see where that intersection is between them. <laughs> that's, that's really awesome. So what do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist or a woman in the field of gerontology? At the time I started in the field, um, it really was a woman's field. There were very few men I knew studying aging. There were some working in the field, but they, uh, they had brought other uh, skills to the table and just happened to end up in an aging situation. But there were very few men who were st studying aging. Um, so for me, it was never unique. What to me was unique was having to start in the field while I was still a student. Uh, because I was working and studying at the same time. I had a professional role, I had a professional identity, but as soon as people found out I was still a graduate student, they started treating me differently. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that was the hurdle to overcome, not being a woman, but still, but being perceived as just a student. So, you know, I met you when you, when I was a graduate student, and an older graduate student, and I, maybe that kind of resonated you know, with you from that standpoint where, you know, I've always watched you take really good care of your graduate students. I am just so impressed by this generation of grad students in gerontology and the previous ones as well. 
I just so admire their level of commitment to a field where, which is not going to pay them a quarter of a million dollars a year. Um, I admire their you know, absolute enthusiasm about the field and where it's going. Even when people like me are saying, you know, our gerontology programs are not thriving. <laughs> yeah. We're not attracting the number of students we should. We're probably stretching our resources in ways we shouldn't be. But then the students are there and the students are, are just so eager to learn and eager to contribute. And, that and I, it's people like you. Yeah, that I think it's so important for those of us who've been in, hanging around way too long to really <laughs> encourage that and to take, a, take advantage of it. I mean, if you can't find a, a 60 year old to do a task on a committee, you turn around and there's the 20 year old <laughs> saying, I'll do it, I'll do it. You know, it's, um, it's um, remarkable, I think, and I'm so proud of them. It's like they're my children and my gerontological children, even though I didn't have to give birth to them and I didn't have to pay for their education. <laughs> <laughs> I just think they're all great. Oh, uh, so how has being a gerontologist interacted with your personal aging process? Um... I think the people in gerontology who have studied health issues or studied social roles a lot probably have figured out better ways to do it than I did. Um, I don't think about it, I don't think about my own aging process all that much except when the health issues come up. Mm -hmm. And if I were more schooled in the issues of health and aging, I might have avoided those health problems years ago. <laughs> but. Um, I wouldn't say I know how to cope any better with either social changes or um, physical changes. But at least you know they're fairly normal. And I think that helps if you realize that arthritis is a condition that will affect anybody who lives long enough. Mm -hmm. Or that sooner or later you have to be that adult who faces the death of their parents and figures out how to mm -hmm. manage that process. So at least you know you're not alone when you're going through some of these changes. And, and at least you know that worst comes to worst, there's a book out there you can find written by a <laughs> gerontologist who you know and trust. <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great way of thinking about it. Yeah. That's, really that's what's great about the people around me who, who really are more scholarly than I am, is that they've all written helpful books. <laughs> <laughs> and you know them. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and you can call them. That's say, right. I, I, I need them. <laughs> So the Wiggle Project focuses on the legacies of other women gerontologists and within that framework is there anything else that you would like us to know for the project and that you wanted to tell us about? One of the things that has bothered me for many years now is that we don't seem to have the, a good role for our fellow gerontologists who have retired or who have eased off from research, or maybe you're not, a pub not publishing as much. Um, they're not really the emeritus people because they're still active in the field. They still come to conferences. They still you know, subscribe to journals. But we haven't figured out a lot of good ways to tap the their, their leg, the, not their legacy, their, um, why can't I think of the right word here? Um, we haven't figured out a good way to tap their, their reservoir of knowledge mm. yeah. and involve them in significant roles. This is, you know, institutional history that we're talking about in a lot of organizations and people like past committee members, past board members, past presidents. Nobody ever asks them to do anything. Nobody ever says what, you know, they might ask, what do you think about such and such, but they're not involved in, in the processes and changes in organizational development or even in, in training and mentorship of students as much as they could be. I don't know how you change that. A lot of them don't want to be as involved as they used to be, but some of them do. I mean. It, 
It reminds me of that old adage about fundraising, is that the reason why most people make financial contributions to an organization is because someone asked them to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we asked the right people in gerontology who are <coughs> retired or separated in some fashion, if they'd like to get involved in, in some manageable way, I think a lot of them would say yes. They may not want to write grant proposals or you know, <laughs> um, run the annual meeting of an organization. <laughs> But with, with concrete tasks that, that match their skills, I think we could find a lot better way to utilize their, their resources. So maybe we could then look into, you know, a, a female gerontology student mentoring uh, thing at the meeting. Well, I think the, um, I guess it's at Augie. At Augie, the, and maybe they do it at GSA as well, I can't remember, the mentoring sessions that, yeah, that yeah. Are, are run. I would have never thought on my own to, to call up Tara McMullen and say, you know, I'd like to right. do this next year. But once I was asked, mm -hmm. I, was, I was flattered to be asked, and it turned out to be a great experience. I'm happy to do that whenever I'm at that meeting. And I think it's just that initial ask, the initial invite that's important to extend to, to um, the emeritus and the retired gerontologist. And, just to let them know that their contributions would still be val valued. That's a great suggestion to, to make to, you know, I mean, I know Tara has, has worked a lot on mentoring and the, you know, to contact you and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, but I do think that's important that we keep you guys in the loop and, yeah. and let you know when the mentoring things are. Well, for me, a lot of what I hear is only because of, of a, a second or third hand connection. I mean, a lot of the mentoring things that I do is because of Marilyn Gallucci. And Marilyn is so heavily involved in mentoring and still active, mm -hmm. you know, in teaching mm -hmm. that she's the one who gets a lot of other people involved. And she, that's what she does for me too, is, is to remind me that there are um, things I could contribute and, and lessons I could impart and, and people who might like to hear what I have to say. Absolutely. And that's how I've met a lot of the, the current grad students and young professionals in gerontology that are just so amazing.